Well, to begin, Professor Goodman, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you here to the Center for the History of Women Philosophers and Scientists at the University of Paderborn. Uh, we're very excited to have you here for this conference on German women intellectuals uh, and to speak to you a little bit this afternoon about your research and specifically about Louisa Gottsched. Um, so let's start maybe um, with uh, you giving a brief overview of your research and kind of how you came about uh, or how it came about that you became interested in mm -hmm. women in 18th and 19th century German literature. Well, then the most uh, single most important reason I got into women's literature, I think, was because uh, when was it in the 70s? We had a graduate. No, it wasn't a graduate student conference, but I was a graduate student, and there was the first conference on the GDR mm -hmm. that a bunch of us went to, and the women were all basically excluded from all the important talks and shuttled, shuttled off into the kitchen mm -hmm. to do the kitchen work and. That made us really mad. Right. So we started a group called Women in German, okay. and that is sort of where it all started. And then from there, I moved backwards in time from the 19th to the 18th century. Okay. Um, and so currently, what is your research uh, in this period looking at? You know, what more particular in, in this period? If there are certain figures or certain ideas. Um, right now, it's Louisa Gottsched, mm -hmm. um, and that's it. I find her really endlessly fascinating, and there's much more than I could ever do there to well, be let's, done. Well, let's talk about Gottsched a little bit then. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us a little bit about her life and work, and maybe what you think uh, makes her such an important figure in uh, this period in German writing? Well, she was actually the first non-aristocratic German woman to be a public intellect, intellectual. And that had negative and positive consequences. It also um, affected how she handled herself and her persona. Um, her husband um, was perceived variously, sometimes as for his work, uh, founding, really creating a body of German grammar, unifying the language mm -hmm. and even introducing a practical philosophy for the Germans in the German language mm -hmm. um, laid the foundations for that. And Louisa Gottsched um, received not only some of the secondary uh, credit for that, but some of the secondary blame because he was perceived as a, a rationalist, a, a pedant, mm -hmm. and some, somewhat dictatorial. So. Um, it was both a blessing and a curse for her, I think, to be married to that man. Mm -hmm. um, but she um, she was, and that enabled her, really, to become a public figure. And others followed in her wake. Um, many um, professors, for instance, in Göttingen, there was mm -hmm. a group of professors who um, didn't like Gottsched very much, but wanted to show, I think, that their daughters could do what Louisa Gottsched could do, so they trained their daughters to translate and to help them editing papers and things like that, to become also public intellectuals, if you will. Okay. So it had you know, a positive effect, really. So even people who were critical of her, it still had a positive effect overall well, on the idea of uh, women in, at this period, maybe? Not always, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, many people thought that she also was a little limited, but they judged her often from the point of view of her husband and what he was doing. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a complex kind of reception that she had. Right. Um, and, and my understanding is too that there was kind of a, a circle of literary figures surrounding the Gottsheds. And were there other women involved in this circle as well? And what was the relationship between her and other, other women writers at this time? Yes, uh, Christiane Mariana von Siegler. Mm -hmm was not exactly a friend of hers. Um, she was an intellectual. Mm -hmm. um, she wrote poetry mainly and some essays mm -hmm. and was a f fiery kind of uh, aristocratic woman who did take herself very seriously um, but and who was nominated to the, the Deutsche Gesellschaft that Gottsched led. Mm -hmm. But she was also vilified viciously in the press mm -hmm. and and ended up, after Louisa Gottsched came to Leipzig, um, 
being shunted aside somewhat. Mm -hmm. And Louisa Gottsched did not um, really approve of her output, her poetry, which was um, certainly more in line with uh, French précieuse and that kind of culture, mm -hmm. which for Louisa Gottsched was rather superficial. Oh, yeah. um, so continuing on, I guess, on that sort of French uh, theme, one of Gottsched's more famous uh, works is Pietism at Petticoats, yes. which was a translation of an earlier mm -hmm. French work. Mm -hmm. um, but it would be misleading, perhaps, to call it a mere translation. She makes quite a few changes. Um, the original text was not against the Pietists, but against a different group. So could you tell us a little bit about the differences between those texts and her additions in the translation? Uh, that is not at all a word-for-word -word translation. Mm -hmm. um, I agree totally. What, um, when the Commedia dell'arte used to travel around Europe and set up temporary homes in different places, it would uh, traditionally adapt their standard comic routines for the local audiences. And they would then use local material in order to perform. And in, that's a that's in a much more sophisticated way what Louisa Gottsched did with, with that um, play about the Jansenist in mm -hmm. France. She adapted every scene. Um, she followed the plot. She adapted the scenes, though, for the German situation in Danzig, mm -hmm. for the Pietists. It was ri written to make fun of the Pietists in Danzig. And um, in particular, there's one scene, though, that she added that, for me, really shifts the whole point of the comedy um, to a much more serious vein. And that is a very small scene with a, a common woman who comes in off the street and speaks in dialect and tells the, the pietist women who are gathered there that her daughter has been abducted or raped or something by the, by the pietist, the local mm -hmm. male pietist. And they refuse to believe her, they send her away, they just totally ignore her. And to my mind, that is her, that is Louisa Gottsched's criticism of these, uh, the lack of, the unwillingness of these women to focus on the real situation and to really be able to analyze what is happening with this pietics, pietist sect in, in Danzig. Mm -hmm. So she, really shifts it all around. She creates scenes that conform to the pietist scene, the scenes about the pietist language, the scenes about the books that they write with the ridiculous titles, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, that's just one branch of her work. So she was not only a translator, but she had her own original writings and plays. Um, could you give us a brief overview of sort of the corpus of her work and the character? Uh, um, the critics have focused mainly on her comedies. Mm -hmm. um, they say that they are transitional from the slapstick comedies that were there in Germany beforehand to more middle-class bourgeois kind of uh, comedies. Mm -hmm. um, what, she, what she typically did in those comedies was start f with a foreign influence and then totally rewrite it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where a lot of the research has been done. Um, and she's also well known, very well known, for her translations, a lot of them from the French, but also many from the English. And I believe she was especially partial to the English writers. She chose to write herself or to translate um, a number of them, including Pope, The Rape of the Lock, and she did all of the garden, Guardian. She translated The Spectator along with uh, her husband and another translator, but she did most of the work. Then she translated The Freethinker, or a part of it anyway. Um, so she was heavily into the English scene, and I think that that's unrecognized at this point. I mean, it's been noted and talked about, but nobody has really um, seen how this plays out, either in her, her style, her writing style, or in the way she um, writes her dramas or, or her satires even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she has, she's known for her wit, 
she had a very wicked sense of humor. And um, she, the things that the Pietist in Petticoats was um, published anonymously because it was too dangerous at that time really for her to put her name on it. Mm -hmm. She's written, written satires too, but about then more academic themes about the Lutheran preachers and what they were doing um, that were very um, touchy, and so she didn't sign her name to those either. Um, so satires, then journalism. She did a lot of journalistic work. Her husband had a number of journals, and she helped him a lot on those. Some things she signed and some things she didn't. Um, and so we don't know all of the things that she wrote. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody's really made, been able to do a thorough investigation of those pieces. Some we know because of uh, pri private letters that say, oh, you know, she's working on this or something. But many of the things that we suppose she might have done uh, are just not known, and I think I would really love to see a kind of a stylistic analysis of some of these to show the difference between her style, because I think she has a distinctive style, between her style and, say, her husband's style, and see if maybe even a computer could do an analysis of that and we could come up with more text that, where we were certain that she did the, did the work. Uh, so speaking as a, uh, as a philosopher, um, Oftentimes we don't look at writing that isn't a traditional essay or a, or a treatise. So something like a novel or a play or poetry wouldn't be necessarily taken as seriously uh, from a philosophical perspective. But um, obviously that's not true. People write about philosophical ideas in various different different forms. And so. Um, what can we learn about her style of writing and, and, and the sort of social criticisms that she's making in some of her writings? You know, what is the idea there and why might people who are interested in philosophy want to look at uh, Louisa Gottsched? Well, certainly she's not a trained philosopher. Mm -hmm. she, um, she doesn't do high philosophy. Mm -hmm. Um, I think if you wanted to call her works philosophy, it would be because she is able to hold, as it were, a mirror up to her society and show them what they're doing so that in Shaftesbury's in way, mm -hmm. she presents a kind of a dialogue with her community so that people can see what they're doing and then adjust maybe their uh, sense of themselves and of their community to something different, so it's a practi it would be a practical kind of philosophy, I think. Um, her satires maybe are, are quite different because there she's really she really cuts loose and um, pokes fun at, at people. But I think people who are on the edge and find them funny may also be converted into a different way of thinking about what she's writing about. So I wouldn't say in any sense that it's formal philosophy. I wouldn't say that it's um, high philosophy. It's practical ki kind of philosophy about how people live and what they do. She did write a few essays very early in her career, but they're sort of like school pieces, um, and they fall into kind of traditional patterns. What is friend or something? Well, thank you so much. I think oh. that's all the questions okay. that we have for you today. So okay. you know, I look forward to learning more over the next okay. uh, couple of days. Thank right. you very much. Yeah.